Between remote work and the pandemic, more people and businesses are moving to the suburbs. The deurbanization trend, that's a real thing. People are moving out of the city. They're buying bigger houses. We have seen that the housing market was incredible in 2021. The pandemic itself, it has changed housing preferences and, and location preferences. America leads the world in suburbanization. I think the U.S. is distinctive in that suburbanization has been particularly large in magnitude here in the United States. And it's creeping up again, of course, but there's an opportunity here to rethink some of those patterns and reset the norm. I think the way the suburbs were built was a big mistake. The cities needed to get bigger, but they should have been built very differently. To combat the economic challenges of sprawl, some suburbs are building up rather than out. Where we build housing, where we don't build housing, and what kinds of housing we build have big implications for the economy, for climate, and for patterns of racial and economic segregation. The roads in the sprawling suburbs contribute to the nation's $1.2 trillion maintenance funding gap. How else does suburban sprawl shape the U.S. economy? Over centuries, developers built many homes in a pattern that experts call suburban sprawl. And the farther out you go from the center of the city, we tend to build lower buildings, shorter buildings, more spread out and more space. It gives a little bit more of the illusion that you live off in the country far away from other people. This style of housing is the foundation of the American suburb and the American dream. The one thing it does enable people is to kind of escape the city. So there is a benefit and a cost and individuals are deciding based on their private benefits and costs and making a decision they think is optimal. Sometimes that can have negative externalities for the rest of society. The New Deal of the 1930s sped up suburban sprawl in the states. The bill created a federal housing administration which standardized neighborhood design and made mortgages more affordable. And Fairless Hills is typical of the growing new community. The FHA guidelines made country-style living a middle-class reality. They also created problems. They prescribed rules to get an FHA loan. No sidewalks, curvy streets, dead-end streets, and made it hard to walk. They also enforce a minimum lot size, which spreads people out and inflates the scale of the suburbs. If that's an expensive community with expensive land, it means that the price of buying into the community is going to be very high. That means automatically the only people who can afford to move in there now are people who are pretty wealthy. A large minimum lot size doesn't say no black people or no Latinos can move into the neighborhood, but it turns out that income and wealth are really strongly correlated with race, in part because of long-standing discrimination. Many suburban towns also separate land by use. As a result, homes are generally far away from industrial and commercial areas. Local governments adopt this so that they have some control over what gets built where, but it also can make it difficult to build the housing that people want to live in in places they want to live. These guidelines were formalized with zoning laws. These are sets of regulations. There are subdivision uh, codes as well as just regular zoning codes that exist in most municipalities across North America that um, provide a framework for what you can and can't build. And these were used as planning tools. Restrictive zoning codes have long limited the supply of land for housing in cities like Minneapolis and San Francisco. Many workers in these cities haven't been able to buy or even rent homes near their jobs, which slows economic development. These old trends are still shaping development today. It was in the 1940s when uh, the United States population crossed that threshold from being predominantly rural to predominantly urban. And all of the growth since then has really been a shift from rural to suburb. And, and since the 1960s, people have been trying to modify the zoning to let people mix uses and have stores, apartments, offices all mixed together, which is what lets you have these sort of lively neighborhoods. In recent years, neighborhoods outside of cities with large job markets have boomed, while the population in America's heartland declines. As a result, the maintenance costs associated with suburbia are adding up. When a suburb grows, the tax base within the nearby city is expected to decline. Which reduces its ability to fund local public goods, including schools, including policing, and so on. And so those individual decisions, even though they can be good at the individual level, can have externalities for the city as a whole. So the spread out development that's typical of the suburbs, it entails higher per capita government costs relative to the denser urban areas. 
if you're building roads and sewers and all the houses are located half a mile or a mile away from one another, you need more asphalt and more concrete and more pipes. Suburban towns often struggle to finance their long-term infrastructure costs, and population growth nationwide has slowed to 0.1%, a record low. That means that the financial pressure on suburban towns is mounting. All of the declining cities in the Midwest face this problem that they just don't have the income from their current tax base to pay to maintain something that they built 50 years ago when they were three times the size. So new, so powerful, so revolutionary is this force that we have hardly been able to appraise its influence. Federal spending can hide the true cost of suburbia. Local governments use uh, property taxes in particular to pay for a lot of these uh, costs. So if you've ever wondered why do we have potholes on your neighborhood street and not potholes on the interstate, it's because for they're paid for by different levels of government. America has a $1.2 trillion funding gap for upkeep of roads, bridges, and tunnels. The American Society of Civil Engineers says new spending in 2021's infrastructure bill helps, but it doesn't cover the full costs. If further improvements aren't made, the country's failing infrastructure could cost each family over $3,000 a year by 2039. Another problem? People don't realize how much of their income goes to their car. In the past, the suburbs became more popular as cars fell in cost. Once you take account of inflation, and once you take account of the rise in people's incomes, the real cost of car ownership today is lower than it was. Of course, if you get a frontier car, such as a Tesla, which has features which weren't available in the 1950s, you, you can pay a lot of money and it can be very expensive. Since the 1990s, households have increasingly relied on credit to finance their cars. AAA says the annual cost of vehicle ownership has risen to nearly $10,000. Making matters worse, the 2008 recession has destabilized many suburban households. On average, people in the suburbs are now employed at lower rates and have declining incomes. Home prices have also been subdued when compared to central cities. Some call it the suburbanization of poverty. There's uh, typically a greater availability of land in the exurbs, and the land and housing that's on it also tend to be more affordable. Experts say remote work and tasteful planning could make the suburbs better. New growth and density could be uh, directed through redevelopment and infill projects. There are so many of these surplus properties out there. Many of these infill projects place residents closer to commercial areas, which could create opportunities for entrepreneurs. If we focus on millennials, for example, they, they have things that they really like. They have bars, restaurants, so some of those preferences they carry with them. And so what that creates, it creates opportunities for someone to open up a business that caters to these needs. And I think that sort of plays a big role in that shift of employment to, to the suburbs. Experts say the most affordable suburbs are often also the least sustainable. So, for instance, a metro like Atlanta or Phoenix has managed to keep housing fairly inexpensive over the last 30 years because they just build a lot of housing. And they build these huge subdivisions, 10,000, 20,000 homes on very inexpensive land that's essentially, you know, farmland that's undisturbed. On the flip side, of course, we know that there are terrible climate impacts from building. So there really is a tension. And you can see that very clearly in California. You see how close those flames are to these houses. Home prices in the large urban metropolitan areas were so expensive that people started moving out, moving into the more wooded areas. And then you see these wildfires and they're not going away. In fact, they're getting much worse. Meanwhile, suburban drivers on beltways are shaping the climate of the future. It's really in the kinds of suburban settings that we would characterize as, as sprawling, separated uses, car dependent, relatively low density. This is where we see a more extreme emissions use. Most US emissions come from personal cars. Commutes lengthened as the country sprawled in recent decades. So going back to 1970, around 81% of residents lived in the county where they worked, and that declined substantially over time by the year 2000. If remote work persists, it could take some drivers off the road. Home appliances are another huge source of emissions. Definitely when you see more sprawl in the suburbs, you're seeing much more carbon emissions out there than you would in one large building in a city. The U.S. has committed to eliminating carbon emissions from electricity by 2035. But in that time period, researchers expect U.S. auto emissions to remain flat. That's mostly due to suburban drivers. But there's an opportunity here to rethink some of those, those patterns and, um, and reset the norm. 
So what can be done to improve residential development in the states? Many regions are tackling sprawl head on. In Montgomery County, Maryland, outside of Washington, D.C., 85% of the available land has already been developed. The county revised its master zoning code to increase the supply of homes along a forthcoming light rail path. This is a suburb to suburb uh, rail line. Uh, you see them in other countries. Paris has an enormous project underway, but for the United States, it is really uh, one of a kind. Leaders hope the improvements will take 17,000 daily drivers off of suburban roads. Experts say that expanding public transit can make a community more equitable. Traditionally, lower income communities have benefited disproportionately from, from public transit options. But funding and executing such projects is a feat. Residents are paying for the $9 billion suburban DC rail project with an increased tax on gasoline. President Biden's Economic Council wants to encourage more changes like this. They have called for a $5 billion grant program to fund communities that abolish restrictive zoning codes. One thing to remember is that every part of the country has some walkable mixed use places that feel like sort of a main street. And we don't have to invent this for real. We've already done this, just recreate what we used to do. And so that's where we are now, that the kinds of beautiful scenic small towns, mixed use, walkable streets that we remember and we like to visit as tourists um, uh, pre-exist zoning codes and in many cases could not be rebuilt again if you wanted to do it from scratch without significantly revising the zoning. Other parts of the world are experimenting with zoning reform too. There's been some very interesting work of, in the city of Bogota documenting how the rapid bus transit network had un uneven effects on low and high income workers in that city. Another study found that changes to the code in Sao Paulo, Brazil, improved the quality of life for renters with college degrees but those changes also greatly sank home prices, affecting landlords. In America, home builder stocks have wavered as the Fed weighs interest rate hikes. A rising rate environment is gonna be very difficult for home buyers, it just takes away from potential buyers purchasing powers. It means they either can't buy a home or they can buy less of a home. And we know that the entry level housing stock is the leanest it has ever been. Suburban sprawl will determine much about the American economy for the foreseeable future. The development choices made today last for generations. So it seems as though over the medium term, the deck is basically stacked in favor of the suburbs and against the dense urban cores. Ultimately, people are making those decisions for a reason, and it reflects a very kind of fundamental economic force that you see in, in many places around the world in many different institutional settings. You know, it took really 50 or 75 years to make the problems of the suburbs and it takes a long time to undo it.